welcome to the 11th session of our series Introduction to Design Studies. What you hear in the background is a material introduction, literally, because this is the title of the soundtrack, by an industrial band, The Form, recorded live in Milan in 1983. I have chosen this track because for me, it pertains to the double function of form that we're going to discuss in the following. On the one hand, form as something concrete and material, as you can hear through the tools and sound generators that are used to create this noise but form equally as a concept that demonstrates a design process. For example, making industrial music. In our course, Introduction to Design Studies, the final five sessions on showing concern the way in which design is represented. From the formal presentation of an object in a sketch, drawing or prototype, the often mentioned disegno as the origin of design, via the mediation of design in sounds, as you just saw or heard, still in moving images to the marketing and branding of design. As in the previous sessions, we will combine examples from design together with their respective critique, so that design appears as a reflective process. Bringing together theory and practice across our lecture series implies this reflective process, meaning that we look at the work of designers but at the same time inquire whether the work itself contains a potential for a critique or whether this critique is put from the outside, i.e. by me or you watching these works. Is there something within design, the material, the tools, the types of presentation that I used, that already contains an idea of interpretation or critique. The first session of this part of Introduction to Design Studies, namely those uh, five sessions of showing, inquires into the way in which form reflects concepts, as well as function and usage, and materials and techniques. Is modernism a literative polemic Form follows function, the three Fs, still relevant in the digital and virtual age. Since the advent of modern design, form and formgebung, literally form giving or giving form to objects, has been challenged as approaches as to whether they are able to present properly the concept or idea of an object, or merely its outside, its outer form. We will look at examples of how such design challenges have been met and consider some principal approach to formal representation. In the following, we will also see how formalism that is often implied in the study of form leads to dichotomies or contrasts 
in regard to woman, man versus nature, in regard to cultural hegemonies, I'll explain in a moment what that means, in regard to historical traditions, and so on. As all our sessions are also built into a larger structure of visual storytelling, the relationship between form and function also reflects here on how and why stories are told, asking, for instance, what forms do stories take and what might be their functions. In analogy to the storyteller, the person who gives form to an idea, an object, a service or system, be it the designer, the maker, the producer, the distributor, or a politician, economist, assumes a more or less authoritative voice or visual display by pronouncing a subjective or a widely shared opinion, coining a phrase or style, and addressing the audience in a more or less inclusive fashion. And this, of course, pertains also to this presentation. What is the authority of the form that is given here? through images and text, through the form that the images take and through the form that the text has taken. Not just the way in which the words are put, put together, but also its graphic format, its type form, which we'll talk about a bit later. Across the history of design, form and form giving, form giving are often seen as the domain of an all-powerful maker the architect, the designer, etc., who is akin to the genius of the artist that is so often pronounced across histories in order to shore up established systems and hegemonies. So here we talk again about the word hegemony, which I'm using after the political philosopher Antonio Gramsci, uh, who said that hegemony defines the cultural, moral and ideological leadership of a dominant group over allied or subaltern groups. And you can just make out in the background a wall drawing, maybe a form of graffiti or street art that shows a portrait of Antonio Gramsci. It's from the streets of Naples in southern Italy, in fact. And might resonate in some way with one of the visual motifs that has given form to all our lectures so far, namely, the street work by Eyes, the um, French artist and designer who put her portraits of female warriors onto the cafes and public spaces in Senegal. So what is the authority of a form? In order to inquire, inquire into this, I'm proposing that the structure for the session is formed by the following. First, we'll look at form following function. Then we look at the etymology of form. Where does the word come from? How was it formed? Then we look at form and material conditions and inquire into some relations between form and function. Let's start with something authoritative, with a hegemony of Western architecture and also by implication, a hegemony of Western socioeconomic systems. Here, you have a piece of architecture that was designed by Louis Sullivan, and it's the Rainwright Building on 7th Avenue and Chestnut Street in St. Louis, Missouri, created and built between 1890 and 1891. Why this idea of Western architecture why this monumental building that we here see in a three-dimensional form? You can see that the perspective monumentalizes the piece of design by looking at it from below, but also looking at it in such a way that two facades of the building are shown to show its mass and volume, not just the site. So why this piece of late 19th century modern architecture? Well, because the architect, Louis Sullivan, was not simply an architect who built, but also somebody who pronounced edicts, laws about form. And he was the person 
who in an article from 1896, so a few years after the Wainwright building was built, coined the phrase, form follows function. And I want to quote from this article that he wrote. Louis Sullivan said, Whether it be the sweeping eagle in his flight, or the open apple blossom, the toiling workhorse, the blithe swan, the branching oak, the winding stream at its base, the drifting clouds, over all the coursing sun. Form ever follows function, and this is the law. Where function does not change, form does not change. The granite rocks, the ever-brooding hills, remain for ages. The lighting lives, comes into shape and dies in a twinkling. It is the pervading law of all things organic and inorganic, of all things physical and metaphysical, of all things human and all things superhuman, of all true manifestations of the head, of the heart, of the soul, that the life is recognizable in its expression. That form ever follows function. This is the law. Sullivan, the architect, is here repeating almost like a mantra, form follows function. So, maybe for you to take a break and ponder these questions. Perhaps in conjunction with a bit of research on Sullivan and his buildings, or on the building of monumental Western architecture or of the building of a particular type of office buildings that Sullivan pioneered. So the questions you might want to ponder is, are, what is the architect Sullivan whose job it is to give form to buildings that house workers who have to perform certain tasks saying about the form here? Is the form of organic origin and the function one that pertains to genetically coded functions of organism or natural processes? Or is the organic form that he talks about a mere recourse to a divine law that the architect can adopt as fundamental and thus proclaim for the validity of his own designs? Namely, if this is organic, if this is a natural law, form following function, then of course if he, as an architect, adopts it, it puts him onto, where, uh, onto a very sure footing. It basically elevates him as somebody who is recre recreating in his buildings fundamental rules of natural design and merely expressing them in modern architecture. Sullivan, Louis Sullivan, was one to claim that he invented the skyscraper. So, taking this for face value, what do these architectural designs by Sullivan, especially these high office buildings, like the one that you just saw in St. Louis, mean when their form is to follow their function. What is the function of a skyscraper? What is the function of a multi-story office building? And, as we will see in the following, what is internal to this form? What about the form function of the technological developments, like the elevator that made the skyscraper design possible in the first place? So is the form that Sullivan is giving here, the Rainwright building, only possible because somebody else had previously given form to an idea of a vertical shaft that contained a little box that could go up and down through mechanical means and transport people across many floors. And only this, plus of course things like metal construction and the use of concrete and so on, allowed Sullivan to come up with forms that follow function. So what is internal to a form? This is something we will discuss in a moment. But let me go back to something that is slightly more fundamental. My argument here for this session is that form is one of the elements of design that can be used to both develop and describe work. In addition to form, other formal or visual terms in the design process include line, shape, value, color, texture, and space, and many others you can think of. 
Form can be used to describe something that is three-dimensional and encloses volume, which can be measured by length, width and height. Simultaneously, form is the result of a design process that builds up a two-dimensional shape into a three-dimensional representation. For instance, when a sketch, a disegno, is crafted or manufactured into an object. So form is also fundamental to the designer's self-awareness. Namely, I am giving form to something. Forms can be geometric or organic, structured or set, versus flexible and growing woman or man-made or natural. Therefore, forms also appear autonomously from woman's or man's conception and follow genetic, evolutionary, biological principles. As you saw a bit in the quote by Sullivan, who is pairing organic and inorganic things and proclaims a law that covers both of these. So please keep in mind the idea that form is an element of design that can, use, can be used to develop a design but at the same time describe it. So it is inherent in the process of designing, but it's also inherent in the way in which we depict things through a form. So here, very polemically, something called Deform, which was uh, a magazine for design work, uh, Zeitschrift für gestaltende Arbeit, so uh, designed work, the, the combination of creative design, but also industrial work. Um, which was published in Berlin between 1925 and 1934. And you can see in the layout and the visual language that is produced, the form of communication of the clear um, set forms with sans serif type form, but also uh, a quasi-scientific uh, photograph reproduced on the cover, the minimal um, development of graphic proportions, and use of color, that here form becomes something very formalized. Form was assumed to already have a particular aesthetic. If you were interested in form, you had to follow a certain form, and that form was implicitly, in design, modernism, i.e. it had to have a contemporary new shape. So the form itself when you were starting about a, talking about a form, starting to talk about a form, you sort of assumed that this was something that was expressed through a modernist formal language, almost preempting what a form could be. In contrast to, let's say, forms that were created um, a few years prior to this in the late 19th century, where often organic um, and very elliptical or um, shapes that were very floral and overboarding defined a lot of design work, both in architecture, for example, Art Nouveau buildings, but also in the graphic language and so on and so forth. But in design history, and I'm sure you're aware of this when you've done your own studies, form in the 20th century means modernist form. And this is nowhere more true than in the Bauhaus tradition and its later incarnation of the Hochschule of Gestaltung um, in Ulm, the, the design school that took on a lot of the ideas of the Bauhaus. Their first director, a Swiss artist called Max Bill, who had also studied in the 1920s at the Bauhaus in Dessau, had a particular attitude to form that would coin not just the discourse of industrial design and product design and graphic design, as we will see in Europe, but also in North America and in certain parts of Asia, namely Japan, uh, through an expert of export of modernist ideas by formal experts that were trained in the Bauhaus international style language and traveled the world to not only show a particular form of design, but also a socioeconomic system that went with that, because you obviously had to produce these modern designs in particular forms of manufacture, mechanization, industrialization. And that went 
with the designer or was a precursor to the designer's work who then came, found all this industry and mechanization and proclaimed that now the objects that came out of this industrialization mechanization needed to take a good form. And that was basically what the idea of those design schools from the Bauhaus onwards were. So for Max Bill, the mass production of goods decisively shaped culture and with it the general form of life. So here it's not so much uh, a socio-economic system, but the entire life, the entire existence, because of, the, of course designers, especially modernist, reformist, progressive designers, wanted to shape life, not just shape objects or systems or services. According to Bill's concept of good form, which he had widely promoted through a traveling exhibition under the same title, the beauty of industrially produced objects arose from their particular reflection of function at the level of form very much echoing Louis Sullivan. And you can see in the background uh, a set of scales, a very interesting um, precision balance that was created by a student at the Hochschule für Gestaltung in Ulm, the design school in Ulm, uh, in 1959-60, in her course of industrial design. So form, in this case a set of scales, was very much predicated by the function that the object, the service or the system had to fulfill. But form, if it was beautiful, could not be developed automatically out of the object's function as a logical entailment. Rather, Bill and other people at the Hochschule für Gestaltung in Ulm thought, an object's beauty stemmed from the particular way form meshes harmlessly, harmoniously with purpose. For this reason, the fine arts, by definition unconstrained by external considerations of use, had an essential contribution to make in equipping the designer with the artistic means of giving form to function. And this is natural to somebody like Max Bill, because Max Bill was primarily a painter, an abstract painter. The aesthetic aspect of design consisted then in the disclosure, in an artistic mode, of facts pertaining to use. So here, an artistic form follows the function, not at just any form. So the harmonious meshing of usage and implementation, application of a designed object with its shape became important. The particularity of an object beauty, believed Max Bill, stood also as an emblem of truth, imparting a universal moral content to his aesthetics. In this way, objects might serve a higher function beyond their immediate purpose as moral beacons, transmitting the values of modesty, honesty, and social usefulness. So, this is from an arc um, article by um, Peter Kapos, um, who revisited the legacy of the Ulm model, as it is called, the Hochschule für Gestaltung, the importance of this design school, for an exhibition in London and 2016. And I've given you the link in the caption so you can look at the entire essay. It's quite an interesting essay in terms of moving from a description, a formal description of design, to an idea of design, a concept of design that goes way beyond this form full of function and realizes maybe what Sullivan had, Sullivan, Louis Sullivan had already implied in the 1890s, realizes it in a way that a good form that follows a good function ascends to a higher plane, to a purposefulness that is a kind of universal moral value. And this is, of course, highly debatable because as it is completely within the hegemony, using Antonio Gramsci's term, of the dominance of a particular model, namely Western capitalism and the design that goes with it, the production of commodities, the giving shape to particular ideas and uh, concepts through industrial production and mechanization, and that that was proliferated ar across the globe, as I just said, and that that rode on the back of the idea of good form being of a moral purpose.
So the moral purpose is a very particular one, one that is predicated by a socioeconomic system, Western expansion, uh, capitalism, and so on and so forth. So here this idea of a moral purpose becomes something that works when you stay within the di discourse of modernist design. But the moment you look at it critically from outside, you begin to, begin to question it. So here is Otto Eicher, the professor of visual communication and typography at Ulm, teaching typography. And you can see the way in which he uh, develops a font here on the blackboard, teaching his students at Ulm. And uh, this photo is, I think, from no around 1965. And here are now some examples by Otto Eicher. First of all, um, a record cover he did by, for Modernist Music by Karl-Heinz Stockhausen. Then there is the work that he did for the Olympic Games together with his students in 1972 in Munich, where he developed an, not just a corporate identity for the games, but a visual language. And here, finally, is an example of his graphic work for, on the, you can see it on the right, for Lufthansa, for the German airline, that is still in use today. So this idea of good form was so universally ingrained into the cultural system of Germany, or by implication of modernist Western Europe, that it pertains um, to a certain standard up to the present day, and hasn't really been changed. So the form of presentation, but also the form of objects, follows a particular function. And this function might not simply be the function of the object, but the function of a larger system that gives rise to the object in the first place. But let us get, go back to this idea that the argument I wanted to make, namely that form is an element in design that can be used for both development and describing design work. When we were talking about the organic and inorganic in Louis Sullivan's quote, then we also come to an idea that form is something that can be organically developed as a system of growth, as a system of change. That it is not something that is simply static, but something that emerges through a process. In nature, a process of plant growth, for example. Here are the famous photographs by Karl Blossfeld, um, which he titled collectively Art Forms in Nature, and he published that book in 1928, so very much at the height of the Bauhaus, at the height of modernist culture. And as you can see, he focuses on particular details of the sprouting elements of a plant, of fractions of a leaf, um, of fractions of the end of a twig, or the end of uh, the tip of a vegetable. Um, he included seeds in his stark black and white photographs that were always lit from a in a particular way and were isolated in their grandeur in order to show the geometry, the symmetry, the graphic nature, the proportional perfection of nature. And these were meant to inspire designers in order to look at the natural world under the auspices of a modernist design language, to analyze the organic environment around them according to modernist design principles. And I'm using this as an illustration 
partly in order to say, well, what does that mean about this embracing of a developmental process? What, about, what does that mean about the idea of growth for the importance of a form? What does it mean for the idea that form doesn't simply come into being and is the sudden impulse of a designer to come up with a shape, but can also evolve over time and the final form needs to be achieved across a particular timescale. So to think about the idea of growth and its relationship to the design process, but also because it gives me an opportunity to come back to one of my favorite sources with which I've you bothered you uh, many times in the past, namely the book by Gottfried Semper on style. And here's something from his opening um, part to the book, um, Style from 1863. And he talks about form and he talks about nature. So here's a quote from Semper. In this respect, it is remarkable that both the beginning and the end of a plant's life are represented by self-contained microcosms, small worlds in themselves. For example, globe-like plant cells, flowers, fruit, illustrated by the Blossfeld in the background, but of course with a 60-year time lag, you know. Semper wrote about this first, Blossfeld photographs it in the 1920s, uh, more than 60 years later. Semper continues, but a plant has a macrocosmic relation to its growth, i.e. it reflects universal growth, growth, a system of growth that is prevalent all across the globe. And I also uh, I told you before that Semper is very interested in making his observations globally, universally applicable. He is not tied to a hegemony, despite being a white male, writing within a European um, context of architecture and design, but he's always eager to try and expand what he writes about and make it applicable to any form of creation across the globe, across cultures, across geographies. So here he says, there is something like a microcosm, a small world, within the development of the form through the growth of the plant. But in the same time, that growth has a macrocosmic relation to other things growing around it. Accordingly, Semper continues, a life evolves simultaneously that operates in conflict with this macrocosmic relation as a principle of formation, you know, it, it, a form develops uh, in contrast to its environment, that is to say, as a principle of proportion, proportionality. So this was interesting to an architect and a designer. So the contrast that each microcosmic development of a design, be it an organic design of a plant, but by implication also the reflection of these microcosmic growth of plant in design features that Semper analyzed in his book on style, that that microscopic growth also has a relation, a contrasting relation, a separate relation, an individual relation, to larger forms of growth around it. So it stands apart in an individual way. It grows in a particular way. I talked about the uh, idea of evolution in Semper that he took from Darwin and others in the 19th century. And here you can see that he is following this idea for design work in saying, well, each design, be it organic or implied later on inorganic, yeah, by the architect, by the designer, has an, an in, internal evolution that sometimes follows the demands of the habitat, but also develops by its own laws. So it has a function as a form of growth. So here's the understanding of growth of form, both as something that is within the process of the design itself, of something that is given form, but also the idea of form pertains to its relationship to other formations around it. So let us take a step back, if I may, and go back to the etymology of form namely how the meaning of the word form was formed. 
Form as a term in the English language emerged around 1200 of our common era, as form or form denoting, quote, semblance, image, likeness, directly from the old French form, form, meaning physical form, appearance, pleasing looks, shape, image, way or manner, which in turn derives from Latin forma, meaning form, contour, figure, shape, appearance, looks, a fine form, beauty, an outline, a model, a pattern, a design, sort, kind of condition, and originally a word of unknown origin. One theory holds that it is from or cognate with the ancient Greek morphe, denoting form, beauty, outward appearance. So whether just because morphe, you know this in morphology, you know the law of, um, of forms, whether this really pertains with the Greek or it's just uh, two words meaning the same thing and this is why they're linked by linguists who study language, I don't know. But for me, the Latin forma that gives rise in European languages to the notion of form is interesting in its proliferation of definitions. You know, So it has material elements like form, contour, figure, shape, it also has aesthetic elements like appearance, look, fine form, beauty, but it also has design elements, outline, model, pattern. All of this is combined in the word form, and that's why I think it's quite an operative and fundamental word for understanding design. Almost simultaneously, in the space of a few decades in Europe, the term formen, formen, emerged from the above noun, meaning to create, give life to, give shape or structure to, make, build, construct, devise, directly taken from the old French formé, to formulate, express, draft, create, shape or mold, also around 1200 of our common era, as adopted from the Latin formare, to shape, fashion or build, sorry, I pronounce this Italian rather than Latin, also figuratively from forma, form, contour, figure, shape, as we saw, from the late 14th century of our common era onward, it was used also in the sense of going to make up, being a constituent part of, form as part of something. And in the intransitive sense of taking form, coming into form, which was first recorded around 1722 in the English language. So again, this might be a bit academic to look at the origin of words, but I think for, especially for a lot of you whose first language, native language is not English, it is sometimes very beneficial to look at the words that we're using in order to describe our subject of study with a distance and to inquire where these words come from. Because to us, they don't seem naturally. I've taken myself in because English is not my first language, as you can hear from my accent. So with taking a distant look and trying to analyze a language, we often find within a word so many different meanings that allows us to play with these meanings in our analysis. So when we talk about the form of design, through the etymology of the word form, we get the idea of moral good, taking shape, you know, growing into something, of aesthetics, a good look, um, of a material shape, a contour, a form, but also of a design process, to build, to construct, to make, to give form to something. This is why I'm using the, the German word formgebung, giving form, in the title to the session. So, it might be interesting to go back, not just with the word form, but with other forms, to their origin and think what do they originally contain in emerging as words in our language, in our common language, English, that we use as a lingua franca at the New School. But, let's go forward to the idea of form and function in contrast and in critical relationship with each other. When functions change or when technology changes, what are the repercussions for form? How do forms adapt to change? 
I think for me, this is crucial because within this idea of developing form being an aspect of developing design and also describing design, this notion of what if design changes? Does the form need to change? That relationship is crucial for me to understand the relationship between form and function and to inquire into this very polemical idea of form following function. So here I want to go with you, if I may, through a certain number of examples. And I want to raise some of the following points. A few more will come up in the slides, but these are the main ones. The form recreates the function that is interior to it or is implied. The form shows a progression, you know, growth. In itself, it changes. The form is flexible, mobile, malleable, etc. The form remains static and new technologies are integrated into an existing structure or system that users and consumers are familiar with. So the form is static, but there are developments inside it. They're new technologies, but outwardly it looks the same. Or outwardly, the form changes. Changes occur formally, but conceal a lack of changes in function. So it looks like it's new, but it isn't really. And then finally, forms become abstract and generalist, attempting to develop an autonomous universalized language. And this is also what I want to end on, because considering the independence of form, whether forms recreate themselves. We will see this in the final slide. So Let's go to the idea of form recreating the function that is interior to it or is implied. Very simple example, going back to architecture, as with Louis Solomon that I started. Here we have uh, Richard Rogers, the English architect, and Renzo Piano, the at that time very young Italian architect, collaborating together on building the Centre Pompidou in Paris in 1977. And you can see, here's a de detailed shot of it, that the interior workings of the structure of this cultural institution, this museum, this library, this cinema, uh, this educational space, everything that's contained in this large cultural institution that is the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris are seen on the outside form. So the form is constructed very demonstratively by its technological and structural components. Technological, you can see all the pipes, they're color coded. Uh, water, wastewater, ventilation, heating, um, they give in particular colors, as you can see. Certain aspects of transit walkways or walkways that go up and down or across are color-coded. But you can also see the steel girders and very explicitly in their whiteness, the heavy um, metal beams that construct the outer grid on which the different floors of the building hang. And these things were so big that they had to, actually had to demolish part of old Paris. This, the Centre Pompidou, as some of you might know, it sits very much in the centre of Paris, between the Marais and Les Halles, the old marketplace. And in order to get this massive steel girders in, they had to destroy certain houses because the trucks that were coming from Germany producing, uh, bringing this uh, produced steel into the uh, French capital couldn't turn. And so this was a huge effort technologically in order to show the excellence of um, the workings of an institution on its outside. And arguably, since the Pompidou is still working beautifully and is still something that is very much appreciated by thousands and hundreds of thousands of visitors every month, you could argue that this transparency of the interior working of the function of the building through its outside facade has been much appreciated. Here's another example, maybe a bit more banal and closer to home since we're here in New York. This is um, Jonathan Ives' design for the Apple iMac um, of 1998. And arguably the iMac, as you might know from your history of technology and design, was a real game changer for the Apple Corporation that had been using, losing money. And this very cheerful, very transparent form of personal computer ushered in a new period 
for the success of the Apple Corporation. And what Jonathan Ive does here is, and his design team, what they do is very obviously showing the function of a personal computer through its transparent, although vaguely opaque, it comes in different colors. So it, in a way, it conceals ever so slightly um, some of the inner workings under a beautifully um, created uh, colorful facade. But at the same time, because it's not completely opaque, but semi-transparent, you can, if you feel like it, peer inside and actually see the workings of the computer. For those of you, rather I think your parents or older siblings maybe, who used to have one of these, you could actually see some of the varying mechanisms of the processes within the Apple working when, she, when, you, when you turned it on. So the form recreates the function. It's very transparent, literally in this case, about its function. But it can also be more So here I want to come back to an example that is historically and also in social and political terms quite a contrast to the designs for the Apple Corporation. And I'm coming back to this example A because it is for me a very apt illustration of the idea that an outer form reflects an interior structure to aid the understanding of the user consumer and to critically display its own narrative, this idea of design being self-reflexive, mm -hmm. and through the media, through the form it takes, being a very apt example of a visual narrative, which is given theme to our series of lectures. So this example comes from He Yushi and uh, uh, the, his series of drawings is entitled Great Change in a Mountain Village which is based on uh, a revolution novel by Zhu Libo from 1961. And these images have a very complex relationship to each other, but also to the literary source that they are meant to illustrate. On the one hand, they play with the idea of tra tradition and innovation, of historical origin and progression, both visually, but also in terms of their narrative, but more, in a more complex way, they also play with different types of internal forms that are meant to be represented by these images. Let's start with the first bit and then go to the idea of the interior form and keep these images in mind when we go to the slide that talks about the interior form that is basically constructed through the text itself. So, the idea of the change in the mountain village, and I beg the indulgence of all the Chinese students in me mispronunciation, mispronouncing all of these names. The idea of the great mountain village undergoing a change is represented by the way in which a novel idea of structure, in this case land reform, agricultural reform, enters an existing historical context namely the village. And you can see this by contrasts in the way in which the figures are depicted, what they're wearing, um, what their gestures and body movements are, the way in which they are interacting, and the way in which they seem to stay sometimes in conflict and sometimes in solidarity with each other. So the line drawings of this visual narrative obviously go back to a very early form of storytelling. Uh, you could compare this to the image de Pinal that existed in medieval Europe, uh, where sequenced images were presenting visual stories, often with a moral or political purpose, to an audience that might not be entirely literal, that could not read and uh, write very well, but were very aware of traditions of storytelling through images and could read these images very well. So these images go back to a historical tradition, but of course they feature also very modernist pictorial ideas. It's very clear lines. They describe the contour of each form, be it an organic form of a body or the inorganic form of an object, extremely well. 
And they have a certain contemporariness, a certain revolutionary clarity to them. They have a, maybe a propaganda purpose to it that is very overt and stands in stark contrast with the traditional storytelling. Although that you could argue that the moral purpose of original storytelling is maybe akin to modern political propaganda. Notwithstanding that analogy, you could still see that there is a tension between the old and the new as contained in the way in which the line drawings work. And this contrast between the old and the new, and maybe the high and the low, the idea of the popular visual narrative of a novel, maybe akin to a comic book of today's so, with the pairing of high art, of a moral purpose, of an educational didactic purpose that is expressed through these very clear images, finds its expression in the way in which the original novel was written. Namely, by the fact, and here I'm quoting from a literary study by an author called Junji Wu, who inquired into a synchronic and diachronic study of Chinese Chang dialects. So a linguistic study, but he uses literary examples in order to make his point. So let me quote from the book. The novel Great Changes in a Mountain Village was written by Zhu Libo, a famous Chinese writer. The theme of this novel, novel is land reform. It is written with a strong dialectical flavor based on the author's mother tongue from the country of Yiyang, 95 kilometers away from Shangsha. The dialect spoken in Yiyang is very similar to the Shangsha dialect, and most of the local words which appear in this novel also exist in the Shangsha dialect. In both novels, the author uses a literary device whereby the description of scenery and the plotting of the story are written chiefly in accordance with the structure of the standard literary language, with only occasional references to local words and expressions. Dialogues, however, are treated differently. The local spoken language is dominant, with only a few expressions from the literary language. So this is clearly a formal device, very much about the form of the novel that arguably also finds its expression in the form of the images, namely a contrast between high and low, between a standard literary language, an officious language, maybe a governmental language, and the local dialect, the low form of vernacular, of the way in which people actually talk to each other within a particular environment. And the idea that the similar to the land reform coming to remote parts of the People's Republic of China, in a similar way, the standardized officious language tries to inf invade or infiltrate the local dialect with mixed results, as you can see if you go back to some of the images, where clearly in the gestures and movement there is a protest, there is a contrast between the idea of people coming in with different ideas about land reform and agricultural, reform expressed in a formal language that is different from the local dialect. So again, here are inter internal forms of language, of interaction, expressed in the outer form of the vision narrative of the image. Let us proceed to another element of form, namely the form shows a progression as I said, uh, organic growth, but also the development of the process itself. Form in itself changes. The form is flexible, mobile, malleable. And I'll give you two examples. The first one comes from a project by Suzanne Lee uh, from the UK, and it's called BioCouture. And it's bacterial cellulose that basically grows in a particular uh, nourishing environment and creates a certain film that can be treated akin to a fabric printed, tailored, cut, patterned, and so on and so forth. So you can see a close-up of the cellulose growing on the uh, nutri-liquid, and then you can see the final product of the material having grown and being tailored and made into a printed bomber jacket. So here the form, although it looks very much like an orthodox uh, existing shape of the bomber jacket, 
is actually organically grown. It is uh, stewarded or shaped to a certain extent by the designer or certainly the, the organic growth of the material of the cellulose is then patterned and shaped into a particular design object. But the actual process contains both. An organic growth that cannot necessarily be influenced to a great degree. There is a big element of chance or flexibility within it. And then the more orthodox design process where you take something that is grown organically and tailor it into something man-made, namely a piece of clothing. But this is the um, act of the design. So this is a work by the designer in tailoring something that is generated by organic growth into something that has a formal presence. But what about when the user interacts with the growth of the formal objects? When he, she, they are actually responsible through the initiative of designer or the playfulness and experimentation of the user for the progression of the designed object. I'm giving you two examples that are very closely related by the same design team, the French brothers Ronan and Arvon Bourolec, and the both projects were produced for the Danish felt manufacturer Quadrat, based in Copenhagen, and they were both realized in 2009. And they share similarities in that they are formal elements that we can be combined in a particular way in order to represent infinite growth. And this growth is activated by the user. Not necessarily the manufacturer, Quadrat, nor the designer, the Borolex, but the person who wants a wall covering, who wants a floor covering, who wants felt elements in her, his, their environment, and is thus encouraged to combine smaller elements, flexible, malleable to a certain extent, into larger structures. And the form of that combination is not necessarily given in full, but to a certain extent is left to the innovation, the stamina, and also the material wealth, the money, because these, are, these design objects are not cheap, of the consumer or the user. So here in the first image, you can see a close-up of clouds for Quadrat by the Borolex. And you can see that these hexagonal dome shape elements um, can be folded inward and combined by raising the edge, edge of the felt piece uh, through uh, a certain insertion and attaching it to another piece. And not all the pieces are necessarily the same, although they might be similar in their outer form, their silhouette, and their linear circumvents of, uh, of space. Internally, because of the folding me mechanism, they can obtain different forms, different volumes, different elements of mass. And they can also be folded inside each other and adapted to, so that the very same elements contrasted and moved around can actually assume a number of different forms. And here in the environmental language, uh, image, pardon, the environmental image at the Quadrat uh, headquarters actually in Copenhagen, a wall piece by the Borolex entitled here Bivouac from 2009, shows how uh, similar elements to the clouds are produced in sequences. Not always orderly sequences, they look slightly experimental and slightly haphazard, but if you can see the expanded structure has a number of repetitions, so there's only a certain number of variations that the user can exercise. But here the design has an inbuilt reflection on its process. It gives you elements and gives you certain formal ideas about the combination of these elements, 
but then hands over the initiative, so to speak, to you, the user, the consumer, and say, now, combine these designed formal elements in such a way that different types of forms emerge. And this distinction between the formal innovation and formal composition of the designer with the formal variations of the consumer gives form, I'm sorry, using this word too much, gives form to a particular concept of design, namely a, a kind of application of an independence and autonomy in the application of a designed piece. So after having seen the aspect of form being malleable and flexible and subject to growth, allow me to come to another aspect within the relationship between form and function, namely the form remains static and a new technology is integrated into an existing structure or system that users and consumers are familiar with. So the argument here is that forms become familiar to us within cultural traditions, within cultural hegemonies, as Antonio Gramsci polemically said. So the moment we are familiar with a particular visual language or with a particular visual narrative even, Designers can use established forms in order to house new technologies, innovations, things that might seem unfamiliar and slightly threatening or confusing. But by providing a form that people are familiar with, they integrate readily into an existing language, into existing cultural appreciation. So on the left here, and this is a very polemical example coming from Japan, we have a 19th century inro, a small receptacle that men or women, more men than women, were wearing on their belt. And if you look closely, you can see a line, lines going across this beautifully covered wooden form with uh, a particular type of lacquer, very three-dimensional, with inserts of semi-precious uh, stone to uh, show the fish and the sea creatures onto this golden wave design. And these lines that go across it show the section in which the wooden carcass inside the small receptacle is built. But they also indicate that the top fifth or top sixth of the receptacle comes off and it slides along in a quite an ingenious way along the thread that goes into the uh, uh, big decorative globe or ball that allows the user to attach the inroll to his or her belt. So the cover, the top, comes off and slides along the line and then it allows you to put things into the receptacle, be that a tissue, be that tobacco, be that other implements, and then you slide it back and you slide it back uh, the little stone or wooden um, uh, pebble or ball in order to seal the cover. And this design, the carcass of the inro, is recreated almost like for like for a smartphone case from 2015. And it is recreated to such an extent that you can even see the, hor uh, the horizontal lines that uh, were indicating how the carcass was built, off, built up in the original inro, but now for the um, synthetic plastic cover of the smartphone, they don't fulfill a function, they're purely graphic. But as you can see, the design goes back to this idea of the traditional inro wearing being worn on the belt. And indeed, you could, see that this, you could say that the smartphone is an ambiguous social uh, signifier of... Uh, maybe wealth of status, not quite in the same way that the original Indra was, because these were very expensive, but also worn ostensibly not on the belt, but maybe carried in the hand or in a handbag and shown off. So there's a similarity in terms of the formal language that I see being used. But moreover, the form being almost the same conceals very, very different functions and technology um, within a similar language. 
What if the form remains static and a new technology is integrated into an existing structural system that users and consumers are familiar with? What does that reveal about the process of designing, of the concept for this? Let me offer you another example from a self-driving car, very much something we're familiar with here in the US, especially developed by the big tech companies, uh, be they Google, Amazon, or whoever uh, within the Silicon Valley in California. For a lot of these tech companies, not just the big ones, but also medium and small sized, the idea of a functioning and safe a uh, self-driving car is a bit of a holy grail. They want to develop this and they want to be the first to put this onto a market. But as you can see from this illustration and the image I'm going to show you in a moment, the actual design, the actual form of the motor car does not change at all. Although it is a radical concept of having a car that self-drives, the idea that you don't need to be present and observe the traffic around you, which in itself could be construed to be quite a radical thing, the actual shape of the individual motor car with a combustion engine is not touched. It looks exactly like a traditional limousine. And this gives rise to the question, why the self-driving car? Because arguably you could say the designer should think about self-driving transport. And since self-driving transport exists already, for example, in uh, uh, subway systems or in rail systems at airports with the monorail that is self-driving from one terminal to another, you would think, wouldn't it be a very simple thing to adopt this technology and say we're making mass transport, self-driving, but now across cities, you know, to connect America and network. But no they are going back to established form of the individual motor car. And this led a lot of critics to speculate, in my view quite rightly, that this is actually not about giving form to a car or giving form to transport. This is about what all the tech companies are about, to gather information and to monetize it, to sell it. So the idea of the motor car needs to be adhered to because this is not actually about self-driving. This is about getting information of your movements. So of course, it's not going to be a radical new thing because it's much cheaper to keep to the old idea because you still go from A to B, but this time you're giving through the use of the self-driving cars all your information about where you work, where your leisure is, what you do, how you commute, what dialogues you have, what conversations you have while commuting, all of these information you give to the tech companies who develop the self-driving cars and then they can monetize it. So the form needs to be the same because it disguises uh, a technology that is comes into an existing structure and system, namely information technology, information uh, purchase and information sales within the high-tech industry and uh, retaining the original form of the motor car in a way masks or could potentially mask the real intentions of what this technology is to be done with. And here you have another examples of a self-driving car, a design from 2017, a prototype that offers you um, through screens different ideas of decorating it. But as you can see, in terms of its wheelbase, in terms of its chassis, in terms of the way uh, the engine is put, it's not fundamentally or structurally different from the original car uh, that Daimler did, uh, the Turbine, from uh, 1900. So, a short excursion of how form can conceal a function, not in order to make it familiar to people, but in also to mask a real function. But let me end on something that is maybe less cynical and much more about the actual value of design, namely the idea that forms can become abstract and generalist, attempting to develop an autonomous universalized language based on, for example, haptic 
sensations. So here, two examples from the same design company, El Ultimo Magrito, um, two Madrid um, train designers, uh, Roberto Feo and um, Rosario Otado, who work together in London as El Ultimo Magrito. And here they're developing a project or have developed a project for Magis, the Italian um, plastic um, furniture company, and it's the Miko. And the Miko's form doesn't necessarily portray its function outwardly and directly. As you can see here, there are three different ways of placing the Miko, and arguably all three of them lead to a different understanding of its form in relation to its function. So you could say it's a toy, it's a seat, it's an outdoor table. So from left to right, you could say, well, if it's placed like this, a little kid could ride on it and play with it. If it's placed as in the middle, you could say, well, this might be uh, a seat, you know, either in the home or outside, or it might be a picnic table as on the right, where you can put certain things, you know, in three different places, um, glasses plus wine bottles and so on, as, a, as I've actually seen uh, people using the, uh, the Miko. So the form doesn't necessarily follow its function, but the form interacts with the user to give her or him or them a certain freedom to play with and to experiment with. Uh, not about growth as in the other examples, but actually to use the object, the object's form and silhouette and shape, color and material in different configurations in order to explore the possibilities. Or here, through a collective project that El Margarita realized in Mexico City uh, in 2013, namely a street furniture project uh, that they collectively built with the inhabitants of a particular quarter of a particular street in Mexico City. And you can see from the visual narrative created through the five images, reading from left to right, from top to bottom, uh, that it goes through different stages. And although these stages are to a certain extent directed by the two designers, there is room for the collective, for the community to develop the function of these objects, this combination of particles and elements in relationship to its form. So the way it's constructed, as you can see, is a wooden structure is covered in bubble wrap, but also in plastic detritus, old plastic bags, um, uh, rubbish material that is non-perishable and would either uh, end up in a landfill or discard it in a very unsanitary way. They are used as filler material and then wrapped in um, tape and finally covered in pre-made little graphic stickers that give a kind of harmonious overall surface to the object. And then you can see that little elements uh, like an uh, almost an enlarged spinning top or others uh, emerge from there that you can either leave separately or insert in order to create, as you can see in the last image on the bottom, a, an extensive street furniture with seating maybe, uh, usable elements for play and recreation, uh, umbrella-like uh, structures on top that shade the user from the midday sun in Mexico City, but at the same time might also be elements where you can place objects and so on and so forth. So although, as I said, directed by the designers, there is an element of freedom in the, which, in the, in the way in which this is collectively created as a form and thereby allowing for the potential uh, multiplicity of functions and purposes. So these, to me, are very important elements uh, in the relationship between form and function for design. The last two slides venture into an outlook, maybe into a future proposition for design. And they pertain to the idea that form can recreate itself. So the first slide is a screen grab from Rap Rack um, organization. You know, the idea of rapid reproduction. 
RepRap is a collective project, an open source project, that pertains to the construction of 3D printers. And the premise is a very simple one. The 3D printer prints elements and components of its own machine. So eventually, the 3D printer prints itself to be assembled by a human, certainly, but all the components are produced by the machine. And once the machine is complete, this machine then continues to produce further elements for yet another machine that can be reproduced. So an infinite process to a certain extent that allows for a certain freedom and independence from established mechanized and industrial processes. And this is something that's very dear to the makers community within design. People who want to be separate and autonomous and individualized from the existing hegemony, now there's a word again, of industrial and mechanized um, production, especially in product design. So RepRap is one element of how form reproduces itself. And the final one pertains again to a visual narrative. And I would invite you to please click on the hyperlink between, uh, behind, uh, underneath the image. And you will see an excerpt from the film Ghost in the Shell directed and produced by Momoro Oshii in 1995. So ignore anything you think you know about the real life uh, action film uh, that came out from Hollywood, but go back to the original animated version. And here the idea of reproduction and the form replicating itself pertains both, and this I think makes the quality of this particular film evident, pertains both to the way in which the film was created and produced and to the narrative contents, to the visual storyline within the film, especially within the scene. So the idea of a form replicating itself has to do with the idea of cyborgs. That is very dear and um, very important for understanding Ghost in the Shell. But it is also of the way in which images are reproduced on screen. Namely, the form that is given to the images is distinct in two ways. On the one hand, you have traditional cell animation, you know, where you paint something on a celluloid backdrop, and you can stagger these in order to create three-dimensional space. All of you, uh, you, you're all familiar with this. Uh, it pertains to the beginning of animation, Walt Disney, and so on and so forth. And that traditional form of cell animation is combined with computer-generated images, CGI, and often combined in such a way that the backgrounds in front of which the characters move are created by CGI, while the foreground characters are created by cell animation. So the idea of transparency, of computer-generated images that are infinitely reproducible and hand-drawn cell animation characters that move across the screen but also are filmed and digitized for reproduction animates very much the way in which this film came into being. But the quality of uh, Momoro Oshii's work here lies in the fact that this form of technological reproduction becomes the contents for the story itself, for the film itself. So this little excerpt, beautifully underscored, I would argue, by Kenji Kawai's composition Ghost City, is about the character seeing itself, herself, in reflective surfaces. Water, glass, but also in forms that show in itself uh, seemingly live animated as reflections of herself in real life people consuming things in the environment she glides through or replicated as inanimate objects, uh, reproductions on digital screens or showroom dummies. So the idea of forms being infinitely reproduced is here a clever play on the value of existence that very much lies at the heart of Ghost in the Shell. What is the reality of a form and when, if it is replicated, does it lose that particular value?
So enjoy this film and then come back to this PowerPoint presentation, but only for the briefest of moment to allow me, please, to thank you very much for your intention, uh, attention and to hope that I'm going to see you next week for another uh, session in Introduction to Design Studies. Goodbye.